All right. <clears throat> so I'm Alex. I work on the desktop team at Red Hat, and I have been for 15 years or so. And normally, I do GTK stuff, Nautilus, GIO, GVFS, all these things. But recently, like the last year or two, I've been working on something else. Uh, but first, I want to like take you back to the midst of time, to the golden old days where men were men and wrote their own kernels. And Linux was in his dorm room and writing this thing called Linux. Actually, I think it wasn't called that initially, but and it, it and it didn't run on Linux because there wasn't any Linux. He was, I, I guess, he was using Linux to build it, but he was using something else. And you boot it Linux, and it printed ABBA or AABA or whatever, and and then he kept working on it until it was self-hosting. Self-hosting means you can build yourself, and that's a very interesting thing. If you if you have somebody that builds itself, you can get people to use your thing to do your thing. So people could run Linux to do development on Linux. Of course, building itself is by itself not really interesting. The interesting part is when you can use Linux to build the next Linux, right? But you can't run the code. You have to have a binary. You have to have a binary build, and if you have to run Linux to get the binary build, like it does this catch-22 thing. So some people started groups trying to build a collection of binaries that you can run to build Linux. And this is like the birth of distributions. And it's great because it's what allowed people to do uh, Linux development. Because back in those days, if you were into Linux, it was because you were doing work on Linux. I mean, there was literally no other reason you would ever work on it. But eventually, it got good. Good enough so that you can actually just use Linux for something else. Like maybe you were an artist and you wanted to run the game or whatever other app you had. Maybe you wanted an email client or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, then you need apps. And how do you get the apps? Well, people were doing this thing where they kept building binaries and adding them to this thing called distributions. So the natural way would be to add more apps to the distributions. And uh, this worked great initially. I mean, people got the apps. And I mean, we all use distributions so we get apps. The problem, though, is that this becomes the de facto way you install apps on Linux. And, and in fact, I would argue, argue that it's the only way that actually works if you want to run applications on Linux. There are ways to install apps that are not part of your distribution, but it's always a giant pain in the ass, and it never quite works. And that's where things get problematic. I don't want, in general, to dump on distributions. Um, I work on a company that does, I guess, three distributions, and I use a distribution every day. I've been doing distribution work for 15 years. Distributions are great. They are required to do anything on Linux. They provide all these features, like you have an actual binary that you can install so that you can run it on your hardware, and then make sure it works on modern hardware. You get security updates, like you get testing, Buxilla, patches, upstream, review of source code, compliance, all this boring patent bullshit, all the stuff that goes into making a distribution. And it's also nice that we have these organizations that has enough enough trust for you to basically if you if you have automatic updates on your distro, you're trusting all your data, all your boxes to this organization because even if the most minor app updates on your distro, it runs scripts as root on all your boxes. Like some super minor app could have something that owns all your data. But it's good that we have these organizations that we can actually trust with this. And history has shown that that trust is not misplaced in general. Like, it, it is not common for, for, for distros to own their users. But if you look at the Windows base, that's not really true anymore. If you, if you have to install WinZip, you've got to download it somewhere. 
and there's no trustworthy place. I mean, serious places like CNET or download.com used to be good places, but now you get like 15 Google toolbars, whatever you want to install. So we have these organizations that work, and it's important, but yes, it's good, but eventually a distribution has to end somewhere or it becomes everything you can ever run on your computer. I like to think that the distribution should form the basic operating system that you run on your machine. And, and of course, the operating system name is very ill-defined, and people have different opinions on what exactly what it means, but, but I don't think that really matters. The important thing is that it, it, it eventually ends and whatever is afterwards is applications, and they're separate from the operating system. So the operating system definitely should include the kernel drivers, hardware support, but probably also a desktop environment, basic applications, installation support, these basic stuff, and you know, maybe even some applications. But it cannot be the entirety of whatever you can ever run on your computer. Because then whatever limitations you have on, on your distribution affects all apps, basically. And there, there are all these issues with applications on Linux. I mean, the most obvious one is non-free software. Opinions on whether non-free software Linux, on Linux is important vary. I think it's important that we have the option to run non-free software. Um, we help people to use free software on non-free operating systems as a way to like, get people to run free software because more free software is good. Why shouldn't it also be possible to have a more free stack but run the one or two things you need? But I think really that's beside the point because the problem that non-free software has on Linux is that the only way to ship, distros, uh, ship apps on Linux is with a distro and that doesn't work for non-free software, so the only way they have to ship software is all these painful ways that don't really work. If we had a working way to ship free software on Linux that isn't part of the distribution, then that would work for non-free software too. So it, it really isn't a free or non-free software problem. It is a software problem. Another problem where I guess really the major problem with shipping apps as part of the distribution is that all distributions base, I mean, there, there are many things that, that, that keeps or makes one distribution different from, from another. But one of the most important ones is they take a stance on a, the scale from stable and old to unstable and new, where obviously stable doesn't mean it never crashes. It, that it doesn't change all the time. So if you want something new and fancy, it's going to change every release, like every six months, whatever. Your UI experience might change completely, or something that used to work now works differently or doesn't work. Uh, whereas if you use the more enterprise distributions, things keep working. Obviously, the problem is if you use the stable thing, that means oh. And if, if, if distribution means everything you can ever run on your computer, you can only ever run old software. And if you don't care about the latest with bang desktop stuff, that's fine. Or if you don't even new hardware support, that's also fine. But eventually you want to run some specific application. And, and you do need, you do have different needs in your applications. Not applications in general, perhaps, but things you're personally using. I mean, if you are working with customers that ship you files and specific version of LibreOffice supports, but you need that version or you can't read the files. Or if you're using GIMP or some artist tool, you probably do want to use the latest one, even though you don't necessarily care that your entire distro should change every six months. You still want the latest GIMP because it has the high bit depth support that you need for your work. And, and another problem is that there are so many apps that the distribution can't have them all. 
and some distributions have a lot of applications, and that's very impressive. But that forces you to use the few huge distributions there are. There are interesting huge distributions. There are things like elementary, solos. We at uh, Red Hat is working on this Fedora atomic thing, which is kind of rethinking how you distribute uh, a, an operating system, like a read-only core base. And these kind of experiments are impossible to do if you can't also run apps outside the distro. So the distro ecosystem stagnates because you have to use these huge things. You cannot like pick the new cool thing because then you can't run your app. <clears throat> and even, even the large distros don't ship all everything. I mean, Linus has this diving app that he can't get people to run. He wrote Linux, he can't get people to run his app on Linux because packaging is a pain in the ass. Partly because the people who are interested in diving, I mean, first of all, like there's a subset of people who are interested in diving that also use Linux, which is kind of small. But, but the intersection of the people interested in diving and doing packaging for your distribution is very small. Like, so the chances of someone happening to have this interest is, is very low. So things just don't get packaged. And also, local applications are similarly not packaged. I mean, if you, if you look, at, look at the Android ecosystem or the iOS one, you would find for every major city in the world, it's like an app for the local like, subway system where you can search for timetables and maps or whatever. Can you imagine pushing all those into Debian for like a thousand cities each would have their, it just doesn't scale to that level. It has to be a way to distribute things outside of the distribution. And, and even if you do get your thing in there, apps that are less commonly used just don't get testing. I know Guam, which is like a Microsoft access for Postgres thing. You can create uh, schemas for a database and layer forms and do data entry. So it's not completely useless. I mean, some people use it, but it's not something that everyone uses. I know Murray, who wrote it, tested it on the latest stable winter release and it crashed on startup. And this is not super uncommon. I mean, it probably at some point when someone built it worked. It's me, I know. I trust them to at least try to run the thing. But who knows, some dependency change, some global configuration, something. The distribution is a huge, huge set of packages that are all intertwined. And the possibility of making all these stable for a particular freeze version of everything at the same time is just very low. Like the less run things, the less used things, just don't get enough testing. <clears throat> And if you, even if you do get into the distro, and you're lucky, your user are using the ancient version from hell that like, everyone knows doesn't work, you are completely under the mercy of your distributions for doing updates. So like no maps had this issue this last cycle where the map, uh, like the tile provider, which is a web service thing, just stopped working because I guess didn't have enough money to produce a service or something, I don't know. But the maps people quickly figured out a different service provider that worked for them, got fixes out. But what can you do? You can like push tarballs and hope everyone picks it up. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll be at the mercy of freezes and schedules and policies of, as to what can be updated and whatnot. It's just, it's super painful. And if you compare it to something like Android, where Google is doing a logo refresh, and on one single day, every Google app has an update of all the systems, and everything has a new look that day. Can you imagine like synchronizing that over the entire Linux distribution system? It's just undoable. And then it, some, sometimes it just doesn't make sense to download an app from a distro. Would you ever 
consider downloading a banking application from your distribution instead of from your bank? Probably not. I mean, you still like fundamentally trust your distro. So I mean, in some sense, they could own your banking data anyway. But, but still, it feels wrong to let the third party do something as important as that. And, and there's various criteria to get things packaged. So sometimes it's just not possible. Like for the longest time, Chromium wasn't in Fedora because of reasons. And the reasons had reasons, basically, from Fedora's side. That they, they were packaging rules in terms of not bundling modified system libraries, which makes perfect sense if you're trying to produce a single coherent distribution. But Chromium had reasons to have packaged one too. But, but it's like these, these reasons conflict, and the, the distro always wins because they're the ones who choose what to ship. So distros always wins, and users always lose. Because there's no, there's no possibility other than going to the distro. So that is why I've recently been working on this thing called Backpack, which is a uh, distribution runtime uh, mechanism for, for doing it at uh, distribution across uh, across distributions. So it has this. We go on. There's all this minor scope, whatever. But I think these are the important ones. It, you will need to be able to build a binary release of your app once and run it on all distros, and not only on all distros, but also on on for each individual distro various versions. You you must be able to stay on an older version of your distro, but run a new version of some specific app. Or vice versa, back rev an app because you need an older version. Uh, we need sandboxing because fundamentally, this is going to require tr more trust in, in more actors. You might, you, you're going to download stuff from various places, and, and then you have to you cannot be running scripts as root from people you downloaded from that you're not aware of. So we need a sandboxed, uh, less permissive thing to install uh, your apps. And, and I want Flatpak to not be a technology that users are exposed to. Uh, things should just look the same as if you're using the package. Uh, once an app is installed, they're in the menus and you're However, your desktop works, it works the same way. Your apps are there. They have the same kind of look. They have the icons, desktop files. I mean, <clears throat> works with DBus activation, all these integration. And, and also, on the uh, installation, finding new application side, it's got to work with the software or whatever application it will bring with you using that is fundamentally interactive. It's not flat back commands on the command line or anything like that. I mean, obviously, those are going to be there. But, but the goal is you should be able to use your real distribution without knowing what flat back is. And which I think is the most important thing. All is I want to connect the developers to their users in a much more direct fashion. I mean, if a developer fixes is a bug, his actual users will get it, not like randomly delayed by whatever their distro is doing, but the other day, the day after we add it. And if they find a bug, go file it, and you will actually be working on the code base where the bug was, not like looking in CBA or Git history to find whatever old thing, which was probably fixed already or completely changed since then. So the hope is we can get a a much faster cycle uh, of feedback and, and deployment. <clears throat> so technically, um, this uses container technologies. I try to avoid the C word because people get confused. Um, it's definitely using container technologies, but it doesn't really mean I can just use. I could as well use Docker. They're trying to solve different solution spaces or different problem spaces. So 
on the kernel side, everything is the same, but on the interaction with the, the, the rest of the system, things are different. Like Docker is all about network ports and setting up filtering and NATs and stuff, whereas this is more about filtering debug calls and connecting to X servers and like how do you do audio safely and things like that. But we do use uh, namespaces. Primarily, like the most important one is, is file system namespaces, so that we can hide uh, the uh, the uh, the host file system. Basically, that's what, what lets us be uh, cross distribution uh, compatible. But we also use cgroup optionally if it's there. If if uh, system D user is running, we can as an unprivileged user create uh, cgroups for us to contain our uh, apps more. We use a seccomp to filter out things that apps just never should do. Uh, fundamentally, flat pack is about bundling. Bundling is, in many circles, a bad word. word. Uh, like all the distributions look down on bundling, and they have reasons. Bundling has issues, but it's also Fundamentally, what lets us separate the app from uh, the schedule, the distribution schedule, the distribution, uh, random versions that they picked. We can isolate. This is exactly what we run. I ran this thing, and it didn't crash. I can make sure that my user run it, it doesn't crash. Because they run the same thing, not some random version of the dependencies I depend on that, you know, fulfill some re dependency requirements, which are much too, like, we require later than 1.1 1 .1 or something, and so you get 1.5, which is completely different from what I tested it. So there's no guarantee it would work. I can also actually not just pick the versions. I can build them exactly how I want. If I need a specific feature to be enabled, or if some feature causes my app to become slow, I can disable it. And someone else using the same library can do the other way around because they, they need a feature. And that doesn't, like, there isn't a conflict here. In, in a distribution, you always have to maximize uh, your, your libraries, enable as much as possible because everything has to use the same. So we can avoid that. Of course, bundling the world is not necessarily super fun. Uh, in, in the Docker world, you do that by using some kind of base layer and then basically hope that it works and you ship the entire operating system. Uh, if you were doing that on something like uh, a desktop app, the app developer would, in some sense, take responsibility for the entire stack, which is not necessarily a great thing. Right? You, you, you might not be interested in doing a libc security errata in the middle of the night because like, Spotify uses libc. So we have this thing called the runtime application split, where when you start the app, it's actually composed of two things. The runtime, which is supplies slash user, uh, and the application, which supplies slash app. And there's a dependency here where the app specifies a specific runtime to use and a specific version of it. So we can and do have multiple runtimes installed and multiple versions of the same one, and they all installed in parallel, you can have whichever you want. But you have to, you have to, uh, you have to specify one. Uh, and these dependencies are not actually the same as package dependencies. A lot of people like think of it in terms of package dependencies and, ooh, I need more stuff, so I need to do my own runtime. But that's not true at all. With a package dependency, it's a technical solution to a problem you have when you're building a distribution. You, you cannot put every package or everything, every app, everything in a distribution on every user's machine. So you have to have a way to install the subset. And then you have to track dependencies. So giving a leaf node, you can know what you need to install. That's not at all why we have the runtime application split. We do have the split because we can have two organizations maintaining this thing. 
So some people can work on the runtime, and we can share the workload, we can share the files by use, we can, and we can do updates of it independent on the app. So if you have an old version of the game that's no longer updated, you can still update the runtime to get, say, a newer driver or whatever, like a geo driver or, or just a bug fix that hits your app. So yeah, don't think of it in terms of package dependencies. Think of it in terms of who owns what, who maintains what. The runtime is certainly not going to be minimal for your app. It has all kinds of stuff in it to be generic for all apps. In particular, they generally have all the security sensitive stuff, like crypto libraries, image loaders, and like the core Qlibc stuff, precisely so that these can be updated on the side. Whereas your app is more likely to bundle application specific libraries like file format parsers or you know, weird language runtimes that are not in the base. For shipping and for uh, local installs, we're using something called OS Tree. If people have not looked at OS Tree, I think you should all do that. Even outside of how Flatpak gets very interesting, it's, it's very much structurally like Git, but it's designed to store large trees of binary files, where Git kind of falls over if you try to store you know, large files in it. it. It doesn't work as well. But OS3 is made to basically store your entire operating system in a, in a Git library, and then you can pull up to updates to it and get atomic updates. We're using it similarly, but not for the full operating system. So there's like a, an OS2 repository on your disk, and it has, uh, uh, well, it's very much like a .git directory. So it's got object files that are named by the SHA-256 hashes of, of the content and all that. And then you do a checkout of that, and then you, so you get the files like, like a tree, basically. One for the app and one for the runtime. And it's interesting if you use it, use it for local storage, that means you get eff effectively deduplicates everything because it's content at rest, just like it. It also deduplicates on updates. Like if you're updating, it will only send you the files that are changed between versions. And furthermore, if you have some other thing that has that file, you also don't download it because we, we know what we need. And if we already had it from wh whatever source, we can al always reuse that. Uh, so you get automatic deduplication got atomic updates. It's always safe to updates while you're running because updates is you do a bunch of stuff in the background and when you atomically switch a symlink and at no point do you get like half installed thing or anything. It's always the old one or the new one. And even if you do the switch and something is running in the old one, the old app keeps seeing its old files. So we're not like breaking Firefox every time you update which I guess most people have seen. Uh, we use something called AppStream. AppStream is actually something that already exists and most or many distributions use. It's a uh, XML-based metadata format for describing the applications. Like you have descriptions, you have version information, licensing information, screenshots, even ratings and like comments and stuff. So uh, since many apps already use this, they already ship something called app data file. For whatever reason, the single files are called app data, and then they're combined into something, into something called an app stream. So we have <clears throat> server-side support for extracting all the individual app data from all the apps in your repository, and we create a single large XML file that we check into a separate OS3 branch, which we can then mirror locally, and then we have a copy of all the metadata for the remote. So we can have a nice looking, efficient, locally browsing uh, catalog of all the apps on, on, the, on the remote. And you know, it also tracks updates and <coughs> basically looks like a would if it was using packages or something. Sandboxing is important, as I said earlier. A lot of people think Unix is safe, so the sandboxing thing is bullshit. But 
actually the, the traditional Unix security model tries to protect you from something completely different than what you normally need today. You know, a, a traditional Unix deployment is a multi-user machine at a university where you have a sysadmin that does local admining of global settings or app installation, and the users are protected from each other. But I own my machine. I unfortunately have to sysadmin it, but I wish I hadn't to, didn't have to. And there are no other uses on it. So the traditional Unix secure use means that it's a pain to install printer drivers or whatever. It's, that doesn't actually give me much. Because what I really want to be protected from is like running a game and not having it be able to read my email or read on Facebook or tweet in my account. These are, these are the important things. Or even like not send spam messages to everyone. These are, these are things that a typical Unix security system doesn't, just doesn't protect you from. So instead what you want is, is sandboxing where you can tell each individual app you cannot see anything and Flatback does this. Of course, if you can't see anything, it's hard to do much. So there's way to punch holes in it. There is a set of static permissions that you can request. And then you can, at install time, choose not to install it or override settings. But you can, for instance, say, I actually want to see the user's own directory. I actually want to talk to the X server. I want to be able to play sound. We have full audio. So there's a set of these static ones. <clears throat> and most of them are technically for reasons that they have to be static because they are set up when we start the app. But we also have a bunch of much more dynamic settings, which we call portals. Uh, portals are, are also a way to punch a hole in the sandbox, but in a dynamic, more secure way. So fundamentally, a, a portal is a service running outside of the sandbox, which has an interface that is, in some sense, deemed safe to expose to the application. It shouldn't be possible to, well, obviously, it depends on what you mean by exploiting. Uh, someone has to decide whether it's safe to expose a certain thing. Uh, but in general, we try to be safe by being interactive. I think the easiest way is to give the pod user example. If, you, if your app cannot load any user files, I mean, it can load its own files that it's shipped with. It can load the runtime, obviously, because it has to load Lipsy and whatnot. It does have a, each app that runs always has a single location where it can always write, which is for that particular app only. Uh, but if you want something else, like if you're a PDF viewer, you want to actually show the user's PDF, then you use the file user portal and tell it to, hey, let the user pick up the file. And by the way, I prefer the PDF extension and whatnot. And then the user on the portal on the outside of the sandbox can freely access all your files and show a file user. And in the end, you've picked the file we send that file only back to the app. In that way, it's, it's safe in the sense that an app, uh, like a malicious app, cannot attack you other than by like showing a million dialogues. I mean, clearly, the, you have to define the attack model here. I mean, if you can denial of service you by opening 50 million dialogues, that's kind of an attack. But you cannot, you cannot get to the files because the user will cancel the dialogue if they don't they didn't expect it. It has to be a natural flow and an interaction that, that lets you, like, if, if, if you click on open and you show a dialogue, it lets you pick a file that, that, that makes sense to you. But if you randomly pop one off, you're not going to select your like, inbox file or whatever. So it's safe in that sense. And we, we have a bunch of the portals, the open URI thing, is if, if the sandbox thing wants to show a web URL, you can hand it over and you get the dialogue that asks you, oh, I see you have a Facebook URL, do you want to open it in Firefox or maybe this Facebook app or whatever? 
so, so the interaction there also lets you cancel it. And, and, and similar to the print portal, you can print without knowing about all the printers that you have, without actually the app having access to it. Basically, the way it works is to open up the printing dialog, you do all the configuration outside, you send it back, and then the, the app generates a PDF, sends it back to the portal, and then the portal can like, spool it to the right printer or whatever, and the app doesn't, doesn't know what printer to choose or where it is or how to talk to it. Or, you know, if it was a network printer, the app isn't allowed network access, but it still works. We don't actually have the share portal yet, but very similar to Android, we expect that you can select some text, right click and say share, and you get a lot of dialogue, you want to share it, post it on Twitter, post it on Facebook, you know, translate it, or whatever other services you have, uh, like that. We are also interested in, in trying to create a larger ecosystem around Flatpak. It's actually, I guess right now, the most important thing is getting actual users, uh, getting uh, traction on deploying it in distros and having apps in it. And I expect most major organizations, people like I don't know, Spotify or Adobe, that already have like a job repo or a, uh, app, get a, app get repo, will want to have their own Flatpak repositories. So we make it simple to install repos, just like a one-click, there's a key file format you click on, it downloads, it auto-opens via mime sniffing in the software, and then you can just install from that repository easily. Uh, but we also want to make it easy for uh, smaller upstreams of, of free software projects to, to distribute the thing. Because right now, the distributions are doing a service in terms of making it easy to find your app, make it easy to download it, mirroring, uh, pushing updates, all these things. So we're talking about having a, uh, some kind of common repository and app store, if you will, but maybe not in the same sense that iOS has, where it's boxed in, well garden. It's, it's more of a, a single way to find a bunch of upstream apps. And we want to have some level of review going into it so that we can actually trust that, you know, if it says the game developers built it, we, we try to make sure that actually that's the case. Uh, and, and we're looking at something called FlatHub, which would make it easier for people to build their own things. Uh, essentially, it would be a PPA or a copper service where you can log in just like GitHub, you can right click. Create a new honest tree repository, and then you say build this app. Like we have a JSON file format for describing an app build, and you can upload that, and it triggers a build, and then you get a copy of it, and anyone can download from that repository. And if someone is interested, they can clone the repository and do their own changes, tweaks to it, and people can easily test that. And at some point, we'll like integrate it with the App Store thing so that if you're an upstream project, you can build your own thing in your own private OS3 repository. And when you deem some release to be stable, you can push a button and ends up at the review queue somewhere where someone like maintains the App Store and they can import your app if it fulfills whatever criteria we set up for it. And probably like it will have automated test suites or verifying common things to make sure that you're not doing anything weird. Long term, I also want some kind of solution for this. But anything that involves money is hard. Like there's legal things, there's who gets to pay, or who gets paid, and is that the actual people doing the development, or you know, the pulled independencies, are those gonna get paid? I think it's important that if people want to pay for free software, they should be able to. Like call it donation, call it, call it payment or whatever, but if you on your spare time write something and someone wants to give you money for it, we should let them. But yeah, hard. 
I guess that was basically my talk. I'm leaving this so yeah, if people want to look at the references. But question? Actually, it, it, it's it's not quite bit for bit compatible, but it's not far from it because we we build things with the uh, the SDK, which is also like sandboxed. And if you that means when you build it, typically you use the exact same build of the build tools and the exact build of everything. So many things actually do produce the exact same. Build. <coughs> not not everything, but yes. If you look at something called the Debian reproducible build system or build team or whatever, they're doing some interesting stuff to make it even more reproducible, which I, I like, and I'd like to, in the future, spend more time on that. Because having bit for bit reproducible builds would help in, in, in many ways amongst those like sharing of uh, files. But also, but also just having reproducible builds is, is, is great in itself because you can verify that this is actually what got into this thing. Yeah, does the OS3 require? Yeah, OS3 does a, a, a file content hash of everything. So, so if the SHA-256 is the same, it will be shared on this. If it's not, then... Statically link, then it doesn't work. No if you statically link and, and the app changes or, or the library changes or then the combined thing would be different from both, yes. But I mean, this, I don't think there's really a whole lot of value in statically linking when you get to control the runtime, well, the library I'll, paths. And so in about an hour, and so we might know more about this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, bundling is similar to static linking in, in many senses, though, because you, you you are in control of exactly what's used. I mean, obviously there are technical differences in. in how symbols are resolved or whatnot, but, but but on a higher level, they are kind of similar. Uh, in the back first, I think. Um, so you are basically bundling all of the dependencies into a binary that you download all at once. That's more or less the case. Because I'm, I'm thinking that you're you're going to have trouble making sure that all the dependencies are filled on all platforms, and also making sure that you're Well, I mean, th th there's nothing protecting you from from eventually having to have multiple runtimes because you need you need an older version. Sure. Uh, what, what it prevents you from needing to basically package the same runtime in? I mean, with with each download or whatever of an application. That well, it's, so hopefully there'll be few runtimes. I mean, that, I mean, the goal is not for everyone to write their own runtime. Oh, you can order. You can only only use one. Yeah, you bundle them. I mean, all of those are actually in the in the in the, in the basic runtime side I've made, but but generally. I'm just saying, like different versions of each different thing. Yeah, but but if, it, it, so so here's the thing: if you need a different version of a particular library than the one that's in in the runtime you picked, you get to bundle that a copy of that. So there's there's no protecting that from happening to like each apps have to package. Maybe the same. Maybe everyone wants a newer Libus SDL. Yeah. I, just, I wonder how, how it, if that might come out of control at some point just because of bugs or things like that. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. It also, it, there it, is it, risk of that. Like you have an updated package that addresses maybe a security vulnerability in yeah. an old piece of software that has changed and you decide what version of what runtime each thing uses. Or if it, this is outdated, how do you decide if it becomes outdated? No, no, yeah. The, 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 there, there's kind of a, a weak versioning, so there's a, call it a major SO number or something for each runtime. And so you, you depend on the 1.4 pre-desktop runtime, and that the 1.4 runtime 
it's not a specific version. It's it's an ongoing thing where we can make minor fixes as long as they're ABI compatible. So, so we could do fixes on those, but we can't like do major changes. Then we have to bump to the pre desktop 1.6 runtime or whatever. Yeah. And then you might end up with both. Or eventually all the apps move from it so you can then you can garbage collect that. It is a weakness of all kind of bundling. Yeah. But but the alternative is, in my opinion, not workable. Yeah. And we're also getting the deduplication at OS tree level as well. So when you do yeah. updates, I mean like I update GNOME nightly, so I'll rebuild them all of GNOME bus infrastructure every night mm -hmm. under fifty megabytes for a rebuild of everything. Pretty amazing at that level. Can you repeat the questions too? Uh, okay. Can you talk a little bit about the roadmap for which distributions have flat pack support now? Well, I mean, I'm not in control of the. So the question was the the the, the like the roadmap for distributions using flat pack, I guess. I mean, I'm not in control of. All the distributions, uh, I understand, but, but I do pack. I, I do. We do packages for Fedora. Keep keep it up to date, and it is in uh, Debian unstable. So by inclusion inclusion via Universe, it will be in the next Ubuntu release. I have a PPA for Ubuntu uh, the latest LTS. It is in many other things like Arch and OpenSUSE has it, I think. Endless. Yeah, so, so many people do have it, yes. But I couldn't like give an exact roadmap because I'm not controlling any control of those. But. Did you put a deep value for like hierarchical runtimes? Like I have a runtime that just wants to overlay over another one and say I, I need more libraries other than the base? It, I have, there, there is something called runtime extension points. Where runtime can specify, uh, like it, it's when you design the runtime, you can create an extension point that can be extended, and that's used currently for uh, for locales. So you can do like you don't have to download all the locales; you can download like a subset of the locales. It's used for the debug symbols. Uh, you get like separate and sold debug symbols. Uh, it's used. For OpenGL drivers, you can pull in like there's a directory. <coughs> Everything is set up to also look for uh, for extra GL, the GL in this directory, and then you can optionally mount in something there. So you can somehow pull in your host GL driver. I do not, however, want a generic way to turn runtimes into packaging. Like, it's not meant to do that, so it's not. However, you can build, take a runtime, like a snapshot of a runtime, and build a new one on top of it. But the end result is distinct from that one. There's no, it doesn't keep the dependencies. And that's, for instance, how we build the GNOME runtime. There is a lower level runtime called the pre-desktop runtime, and then no one takes that and adds you know, specific stuff to it, which is interesting because then all the binaries at the bottom are identical. Yeah. And, and the KDE people use that, the free desktop one, also as a base. So if you have both the KDE and the GNOME runtime installed, they will be sharing the entire base. So, but but I mean, at the point when you install the GNOME one, they're only related in terms of they happen to have identical binaries. Yeah. So, uh, in that example, as I understood it, the point is that, you know, let's say Bank of America, if I trust them to give me a banking app, I want to make sure that I'm getting the code that Bank of America is giving me and not other code that might be backdooring Bank of America code. But I think what you said about runtime means that the runtime author can always backdoor the Bank of America app. So, is there a way to make that story work, or is that not working still? Especially because we Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess that is true. I mean, yes. Uh, so, the question is. Well, in, in, in terms of security, uh, unless you bundle everything yourself, you're not in full control. And, and if we depend on the runtime, we do hand over a tr 
trust in some kind of entity similar to the distribution. Is it possible for an app to use the null runtime? And then, um, the uh, there isn't currently. And however, you could probably make uh, some. Like, there's some specific things about slash user, for instance, like hard coded into the. Linux API where to find a dynamic loader and stuff like that. I'm a dynamic Yeah, so, but, but it, it should be possible to create a null runtime that has, you know, a couple of symlinks and strategic places. So long as nothing can update that. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we could really make something like that a built in. So if you specify the null runtime, we will guarantee you to give you a. Basically, I think what you need is a user lib that links to your app or whatever, so you can ship the. Uh, a runtime linker because that's going to be built into the binaries uh, or the runtime interpreter or whatever. L LD interpreter. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Well, sure. But it's really yeah, I mean, there's always like, there, you know, or you can hack the BIOS or there's always a chain of trust, right, from boot <coughs> to your application. And, and, and anything that's not sandboxed is obviously more trusted than the, the your bank. So it could. Attack your app too. Right. So the kernel, if, if the kernel attacks you or, or something on the host attacks you, then timeboxing doesn't help. So you still have to trust your distribution in the time. Thanks. Sometimes I want to share profiles uh, that get stored. You mean uh, performance profiling? Uh, so, like, for example, your dot uh, Mozilla. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I want to share profile um, because I want it to persist. And sometimes for sandboxing reasons, I want a non shared profile because I'm actually running something as another user or something else. Um, and then there's, of course, the issue that profiles. Yeah, so the question is, I guess, about shared state or mm -hmm. between applications, maybe, but mostly in a single application. I, we don't actually do much about that right now. And I know uh, Dan Walsh also complained about that. He wanted to be able to basically have anonymous instances of an app where you can, like, yeah, run Mozilla, but have it this time only see a new history and new everything. And then have that be transient or something. I think that's a, an interesting thing. Right now, we don't do anything like that. But yes, I think it's interesting. Uh, and the fact that we're using namespaces and we can magically like rejigger things to use work means it's quite doable. But we don't currently do anything like that. Um, I was just wondering what kind of uh, tooling exists at this point for helping to build packages that include multiple libraries as uh, So we ship uh, a tool called Flatpak Builder, um, which is a high-level tool that spawns down the line command. It's just Flatpak Build, it's just, which just enters the sandbox, basically, uh, which takes a JSON file and linear list of stuff to build. And it has semi easy ways to build things that, that have common, use common build patterns, patterns like autoconf or CMake. Like you say, well, this here is the autoconf bank, but by the way, run autoyum first, or this thing is a CMake file. So it just then it knows how to feed it, the right prefix and whatnot. And if things aren't, Standardized using some kind of standardized things, um, then you'd have to supply like a custom made file that you insert into the tree or something like that. Yeah, usually autocomp is, is good enough. Yeah, I mean, we have packaged a bunch of things, so we like slowly add stuff 
initially it was basically, a, well, we're going to assume it's basically autoconf, but turns out that's not really always workable. So we are very pragmatic <coughs> about adding stuff that makes it easy to do stuff. So we just, the goal is to shoot, basically shoot list the tarball or the Git repository and the checksum or the branch name, and then the rest should be automatic, given that upstream follows some kind of commonly used pattern. It works really well because you can integrate it with Ccache, and it uses OS tree checkpoints at every point in the build system. So if you change one dependency and the other 10 before it didn't change, you start at the one that changed. Everything else yeah, is gone. Is it is so great. Yeah. If, if you're right. iterating on you building something, then. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, Flatpak does not require root package privileges. There is a way to install uh, system-wide applications, and that requires some kind of privileges. I mean, it, it's, it's pullkit enabled, so you can define how you map it, but generally that means some kind of root or sudo or something. But you can also install it fully into your user's home directory, and then you don't need any permission. It's just a bunch of files. So. Has there been any uh, interest from or, or, or uh, discussions with uh, game developers, like indie game developers? Because it seems like a, an excellent platform for some indie developers to release games, especially premium games, not, not AAA stuff, but like the next Puzzle Quest or something that come out of that. I mean, we have some, did have some minor discussions with Valve, and I, at some point, tried to make a flat pack runtime based on the Steam runtime. Although that failed because it didn't actually have everything. So I stopped doing that. But yes, I mean, that would be useful. I, um, uh, I don't have any, I don't know any people doing games really, so I don't have any access to someone that will work on that. I'm from Val, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was. I'm No. Okay, so it's strictly x86. Uh, no. Uh, basically, so think of it as distributions like a Git repository, and and the branch name in the Git repository contains uh, the version, the uh, application name, and the architecture. Okay. So you can share multiple architectures in a single repository, but you just pull one. So it's not like fat binaries or. Okay. Wondering about maybe a, uh, you were talking about uh, basically having the same binary bit for bit for each computer or different platform or different whatever. Again, I wonder if that might be applied to uh, the cross architecture. No, we each individual architecture would be the same. Then. Okay. Like I don't know if fat binaries are interesting. In <laughs> I find the ability to translate between languages to be a really fascinating idea. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know what time it is. Maybe we. 10 minutes? Okay. So, any more questions? Apparently not. Oh, okay. So far, uh, do you know who you're using that with? Just in the I was curious if you could just elaborate on why you chose that. Um, I choose Job2 because A, it was a less politically problematic choice, uh, if, you, if I were to pick you know, RHEL or something, that would be, be a conflict of interest in, in, in all the other districts who feel they had to have their own thing. Uh, but also, it's, it's very easy to cross-build, basically. Uh, on any distro, you can build it and, and get the same thing, and more or less the same thing. Uh, and it builds the tooling, it builds, it basically already has ways to build an SDK, uh, 
uh, which is something we need because we build uh, Flatpaks themselves using tooling from. So I see runtime all the time, but actually in practice, there are two runtimes for every runtime. Uh, there's the platform one, which is used at runtime, and there's the corresponding uh, SDK, which is a platform plus basically all the develop packages and the develop tool. So Docto lets me do that very easily. But I only use Docto for the low level bits. Uh, you know, core utils, compiler, uh, develop stuff, the C library, the security sensitive stuff. The, and then I build all the uh, all the X dependencies, all the Wayland stuff, all the GTK, GNOME stuff. Those are built on a higher level. Okay. So uh, one of the cool things I think that's coming out relatively with the new 4.8 kernel is that we'll get transparent <laughs> queuing the support from the host into the uh, namespace so that we can take like an ARM build and run the ARM flat pack on x86 transparently, what do you, does Flatpak Builder work with that already? So if I want to go do an ARM build for my app, I don't have to necessarily have an ARM device. I just have to have okay. a few that work. I mean, I, I know Bastion is working on that, and, and I think it should be able to do that. Um, it would basically just work because it, it's using the uh, been format thing. All, all the fix was in the kernel was basically allow you to have the bit format parser or interpreter thing in the namespace without having its dependencies in the namespace. So I think it's op it opens the file scripter uh, on the outside and then just uses that to, to run the thing. I'm not quite sure of all the details, like if you run uname, well, I guess it would run. I'm yeah. curious in terms no, of. No, I, I think it should just work. I think it should just work. Like yes. if I want people, if I want to have like a simulator set up, like what do I need to do to do the build and the run in the simulator? That's like an arm, right? No, I think I think uh, if you have the right setup, and that involves having a statically linked uh, user space QEMU uh, set up using uh, bin format. If you have that set up, all you should have to do is say flat back builder dash arch arch equals arm, and it should work. Because that would pick up the runtime, and that would give you the right GCC and the right you know the right bin whatever that that like the same bin u name basically, which is the bin u name is a arm binary. Then running that will trigger you email on the outside, and that will return the syscall will then return that the architecture is ARM, and then your thing will just work. Obviously, the devil's in the details, there might be special stuff that needs tweaking, but I think basically it should just work. I think this is how we get it set up on Jenkins on, on that list. Yeah, QD and Bill Sonic Jenkins. Yeah, yeah. Arm. yeah. <coughs> Which is actually <coughs> nice because that lets Personally, us. I think that's huge. Uh, <laughs> one of the many reasons we can't use Doctor for everything is that uh, the whole GNOME stack requires uh, to do you know, introspection. You need to launch binaries and stuff, and that stuff isn't, doesn't work in Doctor at all. So, but you know, it's fine since we build all that in a separate stage. So yeah. So there's a free desktop base layer, which is the Yocto base. And then there's the free desktop, regular free desktop platform, which is that base plus, you know, LLVM, MISA, X libraries, Wayland, lib, SDL, and GLib, GStreamer, that kind of really basic stuff. Targeting other runtimes and maybe games and things like that. And then on top of that, we have the GNOME runtime that has the full GNOME stack, and we have the KDE runtime that has the full KDE stack. Or KDE 5, I think. Or doing. Five minutes, but no questions.